Fanchon Stinger served as an anchor for Fox 59 News in Indianapolis for 12 years. She was executive producer, anchor, and reporter of the Community Hero series, which highlighted people who are making a difference in central Indiana. She's a 15-time Emmy Award winner and recipient of numerous other awards and recognitions. Fanchon's commitment to enrich the lives of others is seen through her work in helping youth discover their potential and achieve their dreams. Born and raised in Detroit, Fanchon graduated from the University of Michigan with bachelor degrees in English and Communications. She is a person of strong faith and today will share what it means to live that faith in the world of broadcast news. St. Luke's, please give a warm welcome to Fanchon Stinger. Thank you. Thank you. So in the last service, we had to keep the timing just right because the folks in here at 930 were watching that. So we're really focused on time. We're not having to worry about that now. So we can, we can stay till 2 o'clock this <laughs> afternoon. We're free to do what we want to. I want to mix it up a little bit okay. from the order we did last time. You were 12 years at Fox 59. Yes, sir. Yes. And I can't remember how many years before that in Detroit. You, you, you've lived in that world of broadcast news for a long time. And, and I'm sure many of you are like me. You miss seeing her every day on Aww, Fox 59 since you. she left the station to go to Dallas. Um, give us a window into that world. What, what, what is the life of a, of a news anchor in a local station? Um, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> because there's what you see on air, and then there's what you don't see behind the scenes. Um, well, that's and about like church. I mean, well, yeah. there's what you see up here, and yeah. then there's the behind the scenes. And I, and I want to preface that with living in... I need to take this earring off again. This is what happened in the oh, first yes, service. Oh, yes, that's right. So this clicking is the microphone hitting my earring. So Did we're you all, ever have to do that all, on the air? Did you ever well, have to? my microphones were here. Oh, but we're all family here, so I'm just going to take off one earring, and that's okay. <laughs> um, and I will preference what I'm going to say is I'm not suggesting that we live one way in front of the camera and one way off camera, or we live one way in public and one way behind closed doors, because Jesus calls us to live authentically and genuinely in all places. So I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, when my life as a news anchor was dictated by deadlines, <laughs> by stress, <laughs> um, and by really surrendering my heart and stepping into a calling that God placed me in, I never really wanted to go into news had I known what came with it when I was in high school and college preparing for my career I probably would have never done it mm. um, I'm very introverted uh, naturally um, I was very shy very quiet growing up I had very low self-esteem um, I felt invisible a mm. lot of times and I had to walk through a process of learning to build my confidence and really getting to know Jesus for who he is and allowing him to place me where he designed me to be and designed me to be a voice and an example of him. But he had to do all of that work to prepare me. So my days were very intense a lot of times. Um, there was a lot of pain because oftentimes I would step into people's lives and meet people at their lowest points. And at that moment, I had to decide, was I going to harden my heart to the reality and to the emotion of what people are walking through, or was I going to allow the Lord to use the sensitivities he's given me to glorify him with those people at that point? On the other hand, I had the opportunity to step into so many amazing places and meet so many amazing people, leaders of worlds and our countries and all of these things, a lot of experiences that most people would never have. So I got a real inside view into a lot of things. And a lot of those views a lot of times were kind of disturbing. A lot of those views were inspiring. A lot of those views were exhilarating. I had the opportunity to be able to share that with people. Um, but, you know, what you see on television, I always, especially I tell young people is, you know, don't believe every headline. And this is coming from someone who was in the news because we don't have the time a lot of times to go deep on a lot of things. Our responsibility as journalists and my responsibility as a journalist was to tell the truth. 
and was to tell both sides honestly, balanced, and fair. Right now, in the media, we don't have that. So unfortunately, a lot of people are making decisions and they are um, getting their worldview from one side and not a balanced side. If you think about what the Lord gives us, what? Free will. And that is he gives us free will to choose. If we're going to live for him, to honor him, honor what he teaches and what he says, or we're not going to. No matter what we decide, there are consequences for those decisions. The Bible is so clear as to what Jesus teaches and what he expects and how much he loves us and the power for him to transform us and to break bondage and break all those things, but truly transform us and be our friend. Um, but we have to make that decision. But when a media <clears throat> begins to take information and manipulate and omit and, try, and, and then has an intention to try and shape what people think based on another agenda, then what are we doing? We are taking away people's what? God-given right and free will to make educated decisions. So I knew going into my career that God placed me there. Uh, it wasn't me. And I'll tell you a funny story because God has a sense of humor. And the more you get to know him, the more you get to know just how funny he is. I mean, it really is, it really is fun walking with Jesus. I'm going to tell you. Um, it's not always easy but he promises us he'll always walk with us. Um, and I've been through some of the hard, hard days with Jesus walking me and holding me by the hand. But he is really a true friend and he has an incredible sense of humor. So when I first got into my career, most of my um, focus initially was on overcoming being shy. I mean, you can't be a journalist and be shy. You have to ask people questions. You have to talk to people, right? So that was a, that was a serious thing I had to overcome. So through the end of high school and through the beginning of, and through co most of college, I spent my time working on overcoming um, the shyness and the questioning myself and self-confidence confidence issues and my self-image issues, all of those things. And um, when I, when I initially got interested in media, it was, I'll tell you what pulled me to it. It was being able to make a positive impact in a community, traveling, I love to travel, getting to know people from all different places, um, and having an influence that's positive. That's what drew me to it. Never did I connect, and those of you who are introverts in here, you will understand this. Never did I connect that everyone's gonna be looking at me. <laughs> and people are going to be watching me, and people are going to be coming up to me, and I'm giving up literally my privacy. Um, it wasn't until a year into my first job, I was standing in the grocery store, and I, was, I will never forget, I was standing in front of the Pillsbury dough, and all those, you know, they sell the Pillsbury dough rolls, all those good rolls. Um, and a lady came up to me, and she said, young lady, are you the one that I see on TV all the time? And I kid you not, I, I, I lifted my head, and I went, <gasps> It was at that moment that I realized, oh my gosh, people are seeing me and knowing me and looking at me and they're gonna be coming up to me. And just to give you an idea, I was the child who, for my birthday parties, I never wanted to have a birthday party because I never, I felt so uncomfortable and so unsure of myself and who I was that I didn't want, I didn't like people, open, when I had to open my presents, I was fearful of just that because everyone's gonna be staring at me and waiting for me to speak after I open my presents. And I would rather not do that. I, would, I hated birth, my birthday parties. And I always thought there was something wrong with me. But that's how God made me. And um, when I realized that that woman was like, <gasps> I kind of now look back and I chuckle because this is, this is why God did that. Had he revealed to me earlier in the very beginning stages of my journey in preparation for my career, I may not have done it. I may have been too afraid because I didn't have, I hadn't gone through the preparation, I didn't have the self-confidence yet. My passion for what God called me to do was not bigger than my fear. But by that point in my career, very early, just a year, I mean, I had a lot of, I had a lot of less lessons to learn still. But at that point, there was enough time between 16 and going through college and being a year in my career that God had done enough that he made my passion bigger than my fear. My why had become more about him, less about me. So the fear didn't have the grip that probably the enemy wanted it to have on me. 
And that is to doubt, to turn away, to go back into that shell. But God had done enough work in me, and I laugh about that now because truly, I don't think I would have done it. Yeah. I, I would be sitting on the camera thinking, all oh, these people are looking at me. Like right now, this would have just, I would have wanted to melt right now. But the Lord has, he's helped me through, through my journey um, so to overcome that. Your faith had the impact of giving you courage. Was there self-acceptance that was a part of that too? In terms of what your faith was doing for you? Um, Feeling God's acceptance of you? Well, my parents were very intentional early in my life in planting seeds of truth in my sister and I. So, and I, and I, and I want to step back for just a second. I just want to tell, because there are a lot of young people in here. It's so great that you're in church this morning. Um, and I just hope that at the end of this service, you have a little bit more encouragement to really start to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. <laughs> And to ask him, I know there's, I remember being 14 and 13 and sitting there and wondering, God, what is my purpose? What am I made for? Because we hear God designed you from, from the moment he created you in your mother's room, there was a spark of divinity in you. You are created in his image. We're all created in his image, equal in his image. He says we're equal, that's all we need. And we move on from there. So f ask him to show you what he purposed you for. I see so many young people who have an idea of what they want to do because they think it's fun because it's going to make them a lot of money. It's going to do all these things. But have you asked yourself, God, is this where you have me? Is this what you designed me to do? Is this where you have purposed me to walk? Because if you walk where you're purposed to walk and if you walk according to the design that God has already placed for you, Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us what? For I know I, meaning the Lord, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope in the future, not to harm you, but to prosper you. God knows why you're here. I felt invisible for half of my childhood and most of my life. But God knew and I knew because of the truths and the seeds that my parents, my dad especially, had planted in me that you are special, you have a gift, you have you have something to do on this earth, something to give, something to leave. I didn't feel it yet, but that's the process. And once I begin to understand that I stepped into that, that's why I like telling that story because God knows us so intimately. He knew not to let me connect that all these people are gonna be looking at me on TV because I wouldn't have done it. And, but, but if you look even further ahead from that now, Pastor, that was his protection of me because being in a public space and being elevated um, for an introvert, I hate that. <laughs> so the Lord was protecting me from getting intoxicated with pride and getting intoxicated with, oh my goodness, look at who I am and look at me. It, it, that's the hardest part. That was the, always the hardest part of my job. Um, but because I'm working in that purpose and I'm watching people's lives transform and the Lord is showing me how to use the media for good and for positive and to, to, to exemplify Jesus, even through a lot of the harsh lessons and the mistakes and the bad decisions that I made earlier in my life, um, he was always there and I never let go of that. So young people, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, you have everything. The world is gonna tell you, you don't have it because of this. You didn't grow up in the right place. You don't know the right people. You, you don't have this degree. You don't have that degree. You don't have what it takes. You don't know enough. Those are all lies. As long as you have a relationship with Jesus, you have everything you need to become everything he designed you to be and to do it with purpose and with excellence. It's your decision if you are going to submit, pick up your cross and follow him and allow him to work in you and to teach you those things that he wants to. That's your decision. And for every decision we make, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So we either are going to decide that we're going to dive into the word and get to know Jesus and walk in the purpose that he has for us. Once you get to know this living word, he will begin talking to you. He'll begin telling you jokes. He'll begin revealing things to you that he put in your life and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I was there here. I was there with you there. I was there with you there. I was working there. I was working there. A lot of times we think, well, we have these goals and we want to do this job and we want to, and so God, I want you to bless this. And I want you to bless that. I had to repent like in my mid-20s because I realized one day that I thought I had all these plans and all these goals, which really was the Lord leading me. He, he put the breadcrumbs out. He was just leading me to the breadcrumbs. And I was like, well, Lord, I want you to, let's pray about this. I never once stopped and asked early in my career, God, is this where you want me to be? Mm 
Am I supposed to be over there doing that? Am I supposed to be over here with these people? Am I supposed to be doing these things and letting the Lord lead me and guide me? I was treating him like an assistant. That is so disrespectful to the creator of the universe. I was like, okay, this is what we're gonna do today. I mean, who am I? So now, in terms of the journey of where I've gone and what the Lord has shown me and how he's grown me and the work he's done and the refinement process, which is not easy, by the way, but it's so beautiful. Now my first question also always is, Lord, is this where you want me to be? Is this where you have me to be? You want me to give up my career and give up all of this and walk over here? Yes, I can, you can trust him. Even in the worst days, I've learned he, you can trust him. Yeah. But he, all he asks us to do is honor him and to do that well. So working for a news station, were, did you ever experience a tension where your expression of faith, being open and out there with your faith, was not always okay? Where they would say, okay, you, you, you got to tamp that down a little bit. We don't want to be very vocal about faith. Was that ever something that was a tension for you in your work? Interestingly enough, in early in my career, no. Um, that came later. Mm. But I, was pre- I had walked along in my journey long enough to be prepared for that. Early in my career, I knew walking into my career, I, this is a ministry. I, my desire, my hope was to represent Jesus because I knew that the only reason I was where I was, the only reason doors that were opened were open was not because I, my parents knew someone and they made a phone call or, or I, you know, I, did, I did something special, I was anything special. It was because Jesus put the right people in my path and he opened the doors and he made a way. And I knew that because my career path was so abnormal and it was not normal at all. And, and, that's, and my message always is, your path may not be a normal path, but as long as you're following and you're being obedient to God along the process, he's going to lead you. Even when we make mistakes, he's still gonna be there to correct you and redirect you and as long as we let him do that. But so early on, I knew that um, this is a neat way to represent Jesus and to encourage people because I knew very early that not every young person especially, because I started working and speaking and mentoring young people very early in my career. And it quickly became evident that not everyone grows up knowing that they were created beautifully and wonderfully by a God who loves them so much and a creator that has a purpose and a plan for their life. And they are someone and God sees you and he loves you. Not everyone hears that. So my desire, which God put in me and I didn't realize at the time, was to make sure that everyone at least heard that. So I was in schools all the time. I was traveling and speaking and doing things and just loving on young people because my dad gave me that and he taught me how to pray. He taught me that Jesus was my best friend. He taught me never to lose hope. He taught me that I am a victor, I'm not a victim. He taught me that if anyone can do anything else, you can do it and you can probably do it better because if you have Jesus, you can do anything. We can do all things through Christ. So whenever people tried to put labels and people tried to put me in a box or, or tell me these things, my dad was always there to speak truth. And my parents came from the South and my grandparents, my mom's dad, was the head of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. So he worked with Martin Luther King and he worked with Andrew Young and all those leaders and champions of of the civil rights movement. And so many of our families, black and white, fought so that, as in Martin Luther King's words, that we would be judged by what? The content of our character, not by the color of our skin. And if you step back today and you look at what's being portrayed and what's being put in front of our children, everything is based on you're not from here, you're not from there, your skin color is this, your skin color is that. Because of your skin color, this is where you belong, this is what you can't do. Those those are lies. You were not created a victim. You were created a child of God who is equal to everyone else around you. Do we have issues in our society? Yes, but your color and your race, your skin, that is meant to divide us. And we have to look at how the enemy is using those things to create division within our communities and within our love. The, how, do you, how do you transform a community and transform a society? It's not by tearing it apart and putting more government and putting people in there to do it. You wanna know how you do it? It's right here. When we ask God to come in our heart and repent of our sins and we turn to him, what happens? He transforms our heart. And once God, does, once God transforms your heart, You can't look at anyone Mm -hmm. as less or more. You can't look at yourself as up here or down there. Mm -hmm. We're all brothers and sisters. But it takes the transformation of Jesus in our heart 
to see that and to understand that. Right now, you know, there's, you know, our children are learning so many very, 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 very negative messages about who they are and what they can and can't do. I have a little nephew, he's 12, and one day he said to me, I wish I wasn't so brown, because he's being told that if you're brown, you can't do anything. If you're brown, you can't make it. If you're brown, the, the world is against you. That is not true. God says you can do all things through him. I don't want my nephew, my, my, my grandfather fought and died so that I knew who I was and that I didn't accept labels. And all of our ancestors fought for that. And now we're being told, well, you are brown, so this is, this is, where, you, this is where you lay, or you are white, and this is where you are. Is, we're brothers and sisters all equal together because Jesus said it. So that's where it stops. There's no debate. So for someone to tell our children, well, you're, you, know, you're, you should feel guilty because of this, or you are a victim because of this and all these things, we have to make sure as a church that our children aren't getting the wrong sense of their identity. We're children of the Lord. And God made us equal. He made us all beautiful. And once we put Jesus into that reconciliation process of what needs to happen, then hearts transform and we don't have to, to, to man doesn't have to come in and construct these things. God yeah. will take care of all of those things. That's been my, that's been my experience. Is that experience. what drives your um, desire to work with young people? You yes. do that in lots of different ways. Yes. You're involved in a lot of different organizations. That's your desire. It's, it's to see that young people know their God-given identity and value. And to have the courage to stand up for it. There's so many confusing messages right now that are not biblical. And we have to make sure that our young people understand that this is the absolute truth. Once you, and my message to young people is always seek and ask God for a personal relationship with him. It's not enough just to say, well, I believe in God, or we know there's a God. Well, the devil knows there's a God, and the devil believes in God too, right? That's where he, he took Jesus up to the mountain and tried to tempt him with what? Scripture. But Jesus knew the word. Jesus was the word, so he knew what the Scripture said. So once we develop that personal relationship with Jesus, and we get in and we dive in, and he begins to teach us and to mold us and to transform our mind and our heart, and we begin to see like him, think like him, act like him, serve like him, love like him. He calls us to love like he loved and to treat people like he treated them and to teach people the truth. Once we begin to do that, then we begin to know who we are in his image and in his eyes, and we begin to know whose we are. Once we know who we are and whose we are, whatever happens out here and whatever anyone tells us has no effect because we know the truth. Does that make sense? Yes. You shared something in the last service I found uh, very powerful, and you were very transparent about your marriage and a time when your faith really did get you through. Do you mm -hmm. mind sharing about that? No, I don't mind. I've gone through a lot of things in my life that were very hard. There, has been, there have been um, times of abuse, um, uh, and they're emotional and mental and physical. Um, and there have been times of betrayal. Um, the abuse happened w many, many years ago with someone that I thought was a Christian. And that's why I always talk and tell young people, make sure that who you are around, make sure they have a relationship with Jesus. It's not enough just to, I believe, in, it's to have a relationship with Jesus and to ask God, who sent this person to me? God, did you send this person? Or did the devil send this person to distract and to destroy and to hurt and, and confuse me? That's very important. And I say that from experience. Um, but in my marriage, I was, uh, when I first moved to Indianapolis, I was engaged and then I got married um, back in Michigan and we moved here. And about a year and a half into my marriage, the Lord revealed that my ex-husband was addicted to pornography. And um, he was chronically unfaithful in our marriage. And very early on, I had such a, I didn't know many people here, and I had a beautiful church family, and the elders stepped in, um, because when that type of heartbreak and, and um, that type of brokenness happens, it can crush you, and it can destroy you. And that, I will tell you, is what the enemy meant for it to do. At that moment, um, a, so an elder in my church was very wise counsel, said, don't go out and talking about this to people, because what will happen in those moments? When we go through something and there is um, confusion or there is um, disappointment and we are emotionally crushed, our natural reaction is what? To react out of emotion. 
So the Lord took me through a process. Every single time there was unfaithfulness or something happened, he never revealed it to me. God always revealed it to me. The Lord always. I asked the Lord, Lord, what do I do? So that's where that maturity came, because early in my 20s, I'd have been like, okay, I'm packing my bags, I'm out of here, I do not deserve this, blah, 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 blah. And that's what a lot of friends would probably, because they love us, our friends love us, but that's not biblical wisdom. When I say wisdom, I mean going and saying, okay, God, what do I do in this moment? How do you call me to react in this moment? Do you want me to, do I leave, do I not leave? Um, he's like, you, ha- you forgive, and then, there's, and he re- said he repented, um, but then with repentance, you have to walk that out. So unfortunately, um, there was continual, continual, continual for seven years. And each time I asked the Lord, Lord, what do I do at this moment? And I didn't understand why God was saying, forgive again, forgive one more time. Well, he does tell us to forgive 70 times. And I'm not advocating that someone stays in an abusive or in a bad situation. I'm just telling you what God did with me and what he was doing through that time. Did I wish it wasn't seven years? Yes, but I can tell you today, I'm so very glad, A, that I obeyed God's instruction and that I stayed as long as I stayed until the Lord said, now you're released and you're done. Because sadly, my ex-husband chose that life. So when I share this story, I always want to stop and I always want to say, pornography is the number one addiction in our country right now, especially for young boys nine through 12. If there's anyone, boys, man or woman, struggling with pornography, please reach out and get help because it, it, you are playing with destruction and you are playing with, it is not something that's secret that you do in the room and it has no effect on you. It changes the physiological pathways in your brain, it stunts you emotionally, and there are consequences that are deep and far reaching. So, and pornography is sin. If you are involved in participating in pornography, you you are participating in the sexual slavery of women, men, boys, and girls. The same people who make child pornography are the same people who produce and make the pornography that is meant and designed by the devil to ensnare you and entrap you. It will destroy you. You are not playing with cornflakes. You are playing with fire. And there's no other end to it except for destruction. So please reach out for help. You know, reach out to someone you want. I can give, I mean, there's no judgment. We have to help each other finish the race and finish the race well. And the devil does not want you. He will, he will put shame on you. He will keep you locked in that prison and it will destroy your life because you won't be able to stop. Um, so please, I just, as your sister in Christ, I'm just begging you, if, that's, if that is a struggle, um, reach out for help. The Lord can break bondage. The Lord can break sin. The Lord can transform that. You are not stuck. You don't have to suffer through that. It will destroy your marriage and it will, it will crush your, your wife. Um, there's, there's no pain like that. It is, a, it, it is a huge evil in our world. Back when the Super Bowl was here in 2012, mm-hmm. we did a series using football analogies for spiritual lessons, but we saved a Sunday to talk about human trafficking because the Super Bowl is one of the highest trafficking events mm-hmm. in the country yeah. for a single period of time. And the United States is the number one um, country for com- the commercialization of sex and sex trafficking. And it's not just, like you said, yes, the Super Bowl puts a light on it, but it's not just Super Bowl and sporting events. It's every day, it's in every community. There are girls being trafficked by friends. There are girls being trafficked by their parents, sadly. That's the reality. And there are girls being trafficked right now in the, the church I attend in Texas. We have um, rescue sanctuaries in several countries, one in Mexico, Uganda, Brazil, the Amazon. And two weeks ago, they rescued three young boys from a pornography ring. The youngest child in some of those rehabilitation houses is two, year, two years old. And those young children, their bodies are mutilated, the girls and the boys. And it's a spirit of oppression, it's demonic. It's a spirit of oppression that grips them and keeps them silent. There was a little girl who couldn't speak. And the pastor came in, the Lord got a hold of her, and the Holy Spirit moved, and that little girl was smiling and speaking after. That is the power of Jesus. Jesus is not just something we sing about and not just this thing in the scare. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He walked out of the tomb, people. That is not just a story. He walked out of the tomb. Think about that. That is our best friend. And he has the power to transform your heart and your life and break any bondage 
Right now, there's so much being thrown at us that is not okay with, with the Lord. But he can, he can transform us and he can break those bonds. And when, when we talk about pornography, um, it is a serious grip. So, so going through that, it was not easy. There were days I, would, I was going to work. No one at work knew I was going through that. No one at work knew I was dying and crying inside almost every day. There were days I'd be doing the news and I would just be praying that I didn't break down on air and just start crying because of something maybe that triggered the pain, the sadness that I was dealing with at home. But God is so gracious in that while I was going through probably one of the hardest times in my life, he was putting people in front of me that required me to step into their life and step into their pain and to remind them of scripture, remind them of God's truth. And as I was encouraging other people, they had no idea that I was barely making it, barely. But because the Lord put those people strategically in my path, it required me to encourage them to, to not have self-pity, to step out of myself. But as I was re- repeating truth to them, I was also speaking to me. And it was what God's way of encouraging me through it. And you know, if you've grown up in a Christian home like I did, you hear that scripture all the time, consider it all joy, brother, when you go through trials. Well, it is not fun going through a trial. Who enjoys going through trials and suffering? No. However, and that's one of the scriptures, that's why that's Romans 5 is my favorite scripture. Because when we go through the hardest things in life, when we are completely broken and completely desperate, for help or for, for, that, to, for the Lord to fill that void, that is when he will reach out of heaven and quite literally work and move in your life, bring people you would have never been able to maybe meet if not for God putting it together. That's when you're gonna see how far God will go to lift you up, to carry you. Each of my days became, okay, Lord, I only had two seconds in the morning. I would wake up and I timed it. During those seven years, I had two seconds where I would wake up, I felt peace, and then within two seconds, I was gripped with fear. And so my decision during those days was, do I believe what the Bible says is true? I either have one or two choices, trust Jesus or not trust Jesus. But I knew enough to know in my faith that I do trust, and Lord, I do want to trust you. My life's in flames, what am I gonna do? There's, you know, there's manipulation, there's lying, there's all of these things, there's, you know, um, Unfaith, there's everything. What am I going to do? And the Lord always says what? Trust me. I work everything out for your good. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jeremiah 29, 11 was the verse I held on to. For I know the plans I had for you, say the Lord. Plans to give you hope in the future. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. So I had to trust that even in that, God was good and he was there. And it was my choice. I'm going to trust or I'm not going to trust. I'm going to accept bitterness and anger or I'm not going to, I'm going to trust him. So I remember the day driving to the studio. I was on 465 and literally I felt alone. I felt dejected. I, I mean, it was, it was awful. I can't, I, I'm writing a book right now where I go into more depths of, the, of what that pain is like. But I remember just laughing and I'm like, I finally understand what it means to have joy in the midst of trial. It's not that you're excited and you're enjoying the fire, it's that you understand that you're not alone, that God loves you so much, he is deeply, intimately involved in what you're going through. He's walking through it with you, and because of that, because the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the highest of the most high, is walking with me and carrying me and revealing things to me and teaching me and showing me, I can have peace because I trust him more than me. There were days I didn't think I could make it. I was having anxiety attacks. I was on a heart monitor at one point. But because I knew that God's never gonna give me more than I can take, if he's putting me in this fire, then he knows I can make it. I may not believe I can make it. You may not believe you can make it. You may may not believe that you can overcome what's going on in your life right now. But if God's allowing it in your life, you can overcome it. He will help you overcome it because he wouldn't put you in something that's going to destroy you. The question is, are you going to trust him to walk with you and to take you through it? Um, and And once I did that, then at the very end, the Lord showed me why I had to stay there. He wanted me to understand the depths of spiritual warfare. He wanted me to understand how far the devil will go to manipulate you, to confuse you, to make you see things, and what that spiritual warfare looks like in terms of destroying families and destroying a marriage and gripping people with sin and that 
and that uh, spiritual demonic oppression that can grip on to bondage and grip onto someone's life. And then at the end of the day, the Lord knew I needed to know my ex-husband sadly, and I still pray for his soul and his salvation. I have no bitterness towards him. He's a broken man. He just, he chose sin. He chose that world. He chose and he walked away from the Lord. And it was at that point after God said, I gave you someone who was willing to walk with you and to forgive and keep going, but you used, you misused that grace. Now I'm removing her. And now, you know, if you continue in sin, what does the Bible tell us? The Lord will eventually give you over to that. And so I pray that, you know, he comes back to the Lord and his relationship with Jesus. But in that I can tell you today, I would walk through every single day of that again for seven years because I came out of that with a friendship and a relationship with Jesus I never would have had. And I know him so intimately. Now my desire is that each and every one of you know Jesus like I know him. He literally would pick me off the floor crying and he would, and, I, and he had ways of showing me that it was him giving me a hug or showing me this or teaching me wisdom. And once you surrender to that and allow God to come in, what does the scripture tell us? Not, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. God is not going to bust the door down and come get you. He's waiting for you to say, Jesus, come in. And once he comes in, what he does in your heart will be so transformative. You will have so much peace and clarity about who you are and where your life is supposed to go and what he says, not what the world says, but what he says that he calls us to do and how he calls us to live. There will be so much joy and so much peace in that. And that's my desire for every young person to get that earlier than I did. Um, but I'm so grateful. And all the things I've been through, I've been publicly maligned, my character's been a set, people have lied on me in public and on, in the media, but, it's, but the Lord has walked me through all of those things because he had to remove the fear. He had to remove the fear of man. Why does the church a lot of times not speak up for what the gospel says? Because there's fear of man. And, and you're told by certain people, if you say this and Jesus is that, da, 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 then you're, 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 gonna be, you're going to be um, rejected, okay. Because at the end of the day, if I say something that's not biblical, and I will encourage you, anything I say always, I'm, I'm learning and Jesus is working on me just like he's working on everyone else, check it against the word of God. The word of God is very clear. Jesus doesn't mince words. His, his, his word and his truth is, is true yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It hasn't changed, and it's not going to change. But his love for us is steadfast. And he loves us and he can do a work in each and every person's life and in our hearts. So I don't want to preach at anyone, but that's my journey because I know what God has, did, I, has done. I know I've watched the transformative power. When I was early in my career, this is not, I was not like this. I was still so timid and quiet in terms of my faith. But because, when God does something to you and for you and through you and you see him not just work in my life but in people and stories that I've done in families and when there's hardship, when there's brokenness and transforming people's lives through stories that I've been able to be a part of, you can't help but want to share that. And, and, and you want people to experience that same thing. And there have been times, yes, later in my career, people would say, well, you know, I'm trying to think if I, sh if I can share this story. Do you want me to share this story? <laughs> I will say when we had, remember the mass shooting in Noblesville? Um, and what happened a few days after that? Um, everyone did what? People were showing up at churches and praying, right? Even people who didn't go to church were showing up at churches. They were praying because they wanted what? They wanted answers, they wanted comfort, they wanted peace. So it was an opportunity for me to bring my pastor on and to talk about and to talk to the, to the viewers, what do you do when you have questions? Why do bad things happen? Where is God in this? Well, God is in it and through it. We have, to, we have to be able to have opportunities for the Lord to show his love and to show his grace and for us to be able to step in and, and exhibit that. So a lot of times when people say, well, if, if God was a God of love, why would he do this? Well, he's not doing it. We're living in a broken world. The enemy is doing it. But it gives us the opportunity to show how gracious and how powerful and how, and how transformative God's love is. So when I brought that on, 
and my pastor came on, he was talking about how the, how the Bible calls us to respond in tragedy and talked about how he calls us to look at fear and respond in, to fear and all of those things. And there was one or two people who, who said, well, he's just, he's just mentioning Jesus too much. You can never mention Jesus too much, by the way. I don't care who says that to you because that's the only reason why we're here and in our right minds is because of him. Um, but, and so I left the set and I was getting ready to go home and someone happened to mention to me who went to my church as well, oh, they just pulled the pastor off the website. I said, oh, well, in this country, I think I know that we have freedom of religion. So that means you have the freedom to believe or not to believe, and you have the freedom to speak. So I had to pray, first of all, about how I was going to handle that situation. Because when, when the Lord puts an opportunity or a situation comes in front of us as believers, how we respond speaks so much loud, more loudly about our testimony than we might realize. So in that moment, I knew there were believers watching to see how I was going to respond, and there were non-believers watching, seeing how I was going to respond. So what did I do? Did I go and yell and confront anyone? No. Packed up my bag, got in my car, and I started praying. Lord, what do I do in this situation? And I called my boss at the time. There's, that boss is no longer here. And I said, I was told that um, the pastor's remarks were removed off the website. And she said, yeah, yeah, he just kept talking about the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Well, that is the absolute truth. Um, and, and people have a choice whether or not they want to believe the Bible or not. And um, I said, okay. I said, well, I'd like to set up a meeting with you to come in to understand exactly why and what he said that required it to be removed from the website because we have rules, digital rules. If it's profanity, it gets pulled. If it's hate speech, it gets pulled. And if it's threatening, it gets pulled. Those were the three things. None of those things happened. So again, I went home and I prayed. I'm like, Lord, help me, give me wisdom. And so I went back to have the meeting the next day and I was calm. I had my notepad and I said, okay, well, these are my concerns. And I said, we are in a situation now where our entire community is searching for answers. People are broken. There is so much sadness and so much fear. We have, you know, based on what happened, I said, people were showing up at churches and filling parking lots. They weren't praying to rocks. They were praying to God for help and guidance. And in that moment, it's our opportunity to step in as a news station and give people an another option. That's what we do. We're supposed to be fair and balanced. We're supposed to you know, show everything. And I said, that's what he was doing. We asked him to come on as a pastor, so he was talking as, I mean, if you came on as a pastor, you'd talk about Jesus. That's what your role is. That was, that was the way he ministers. And then I said, well, can you just give me a list of the, of the things that he violated so that um, I can go back and explain to all the people who are calling me now and asking why it was taken down because they, I need to give them an answer because I don't want in any way to be viewed as someone who's censoring anyone's speech or censoring the gospel. And so I just, and I said nothing else. I just sat there ready to write down the violations. Well, uh, you know what? We can put it back up. <laughs> And that, and it went back up within 30 minutes. But in those instances, God calls us to be courageous. But being courageous a lot of times and being outspoken doesn't mean fighting the way we out of emotion want to fight. Well, I want to affirm that uh, when it comes to your faith, you've obviously gotten over your shyness. You, <laughs> you have a strong faith. And uh, I, I regret that we're out of time. That's okay. But there are some things that you've been sharing that I just want to... Uh, tag and make sure we, we do receive and understand the power of what has been shared. Fanchon speaks about the transformative power of a relationship with Christ that makes a real difference in her life. And sometimes it's so easy to get focused on what we're doing in the Christian life. We don't emphasize enough what's been done for us and that it has been life-changing for you. Yeah. And then you shared this before. I will share. Your cards. Yeah. I will, I, and I will share this because this is some practical information that this is what God taught me through that seven years. I didn't even know he was teaching me this until the end, and he did a lot of work with me in terms of healing my heart. Only God can heal your heart when it's broken and trampled on. You can't fill that with 
um, shopping, ladies. You can't fill that with eating. You can't fill any of that hurt and that pain with anything except for Jesus. And so I'm going to give you what God taught me through those seven years. And it's what I cling to and it's what I teach all over the country. It's four words. It's cling, focus, fight, and share. When something happens in your life, there's disappointment. There's an unexpected circumstance. You're down. You're, you, don't, you don't have the answers. You have to first determine today, before it happens, that when, because it is going to happen. God tells us that we're going to go through trial. He, the prayer is not, Lord, take it away. The prayer is, Lord, walk me through it, because there's always a reason why God allows things in our life. And so when he allows the unexpected or something tragic in your life, you have to determine now that when this happens, I am going to not respond out of emotion because right there is where the devil can get you. Right there is where he can bring in bitterness, anger, or sin to try and cover what God is trying to show you or to try and deter you from what God has for you. So you need to determine, to, I'm gonna to cling to the scripture. What are your favorite scriptures? Mine, Jeremiah 29, 11, I've said it a couple times today. The Lord's saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can do all things through Christ. Who am I afraid of? Why would I be afraid of a mere mortal man when the only accountability I have is to Jesus? So in that moment, in clinging to Scripture at that point, what does that do? That pauses your emotion. And it reminds you of truth, the truth of what Jesus says. A lot of times people get messed up because they respond or make a decision when they're emotional, and that can lead you down a bad path. So cling is the first thing. Once we cling, then God needs us to focus. Focus on what? What our friends are telling us, what we feel, no. A lot of times what we feel is not truth. It can feel like it's really true. It can, a feeling can be real, but a feeling may not be true. You may be feeling inadequate today, but does, does God say you're inadequate? You may be feeling, you know, like you don't belong, but is that true? God says that he purposed you and prepared you somewhere for, every, for, for a reason. You do belong. So when we, what we feel not always is true. So when we focus, that means getting into the Bible, getting into the Word of God, spending time with the Lord each and every day. That is critical, especially right now. A lot of people are getting confused about what the Bible says about things because they don't know what the Bible says and they're not in it. God will show it to us. So get in the Word, focus. God will then begin to build a friendship with you. You will then begin to know Him in an intimate, personal way. And what will that do? That will begin to transform your mind to see like Jesus sees, to understand like He understands, to love like He loves, to be able to respond and to know truth versus non-truth light versus darkness. He will show you that. You don't need someone to tell you that because Jesus has already left the word here for us. And when you focus on that, you, he will begin to transfer and you, your trust will grow in him. Your relationship will grow. There's nothing like having a relationship with Jesus. And then once you focus and now he's transforming your mind and transforming your heart, what's the next thing? To fight. I am a once you know Jesus and you know what he's done and he has shown his true character to you, you are willing to stand up from that. That was my second scripture, Acts 20, 24. I don't care about my life. I just want to be able to share what I know God has done and who he is with people so that people can have that same opportunity to know him the same way. And that is what he tells us to do as believers. That's, our, that's what he has commanded us to do. So fight. What does that mean? Does that mean you get up in someone's face and tell them off? Well, yeah, sometimes we feel like that, but is that what we, he calls us to do? No. He calls us to listen to his instructions. So fight, I love that word because, you know, when we hear it, we think we're going to fight, we're going we're gonna to stand up, we're going to yell, we're going to scream, we're going to do whatever these things are. But in that moment when I was challenged, the Lord called me to fight, but how? It was to be still, go home, to pray, and then he gave me how to handle it, and I was able to do that, and that was the fight, and it was more powerful than what, me yelling at someone, making a call, and, you know, handling it a different way out of emotion. So fighting is responding to situations, how God calls us to respond to situations, and sometimes it may be, yes, speaking up, maybe being quiet. And then once we do that, the Lord produces in our heart and in our lives a story of hope and of transformation. And there's so much hope in what God has for us. And out of that hope, then we have a story to, t to tell and a testimony to share. Um, and Jesus says in his scripture, always be wed ready and willing to share why you have hope in Christ or share your hope that you have in Christ. So that's really it. So it's cling, focus, fight, be obedient in every detail and share. 
And going through that um, now in terms of what I'm doing is I'm living in total surrender. So now the question is, Lord, where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? And um, how can I just honor you more? Well, I regret we're out of time. Would you join <laughs> me in thanking Fanch and Stinger for being Thank with you. us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.